Yes, we're actually coming to you from the past, which I think is very appropriate for historical fiction. <laughs> My name is Carrie Callahan. I am the author of two historical novels, one, Salt, or sorry, A Light of Her Own, and the other, Salt the Snow, both about strong women from history. And I live in Maryland, in Eugenia. Well, I'm Eugenia Kim, and I am the author of The Polygrapher's Daughter. This is um, the original version. This is the updated British version. And also The Kinship of Secrets. This is the original version. This is the British version. So I like the British version, but I like them both. The yeah, British version is striking. Yeah, yeah. And I'm happy to be here to talk to you guys about historical fiction. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining me. So we thought the first thing we would kind of kick it off with is, is what is historical fiction? So Eugenia, what do you think? Well, I think it's any story that where the past, and I would say it has to be maybe 50 years in the past, um, has a key role. So because if, if it's like 40 years or then, then that's still relatable, you know, that's not far enough back, I think, to be considered history. So yeah, yeah there's absolutely. No definition, is there, I don't think there's a definition. What would you say? Like definitions vary um, quite a lot. Um, yeah, I would say it's a book set, maybe a generation past, you know, so about, that would be about the same, um, where history is a key, uh, is a narrative element. Uh, you know, it does something for the story. And I read a book recently that kind of surprised me in being set in the past, and yet I wouldn't call it historical fiction because there was no sense of history to it. It was a beautiful book, a Dictionary of Animal Languages, about, it's actually about Leonora Carrington, who's a historical figure, but there's zero sense of history. It could have been, it's just dialogue and it's very modern feeling. So it could have oh, been interesting. Anywhere. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's a great book. I recommend it. Um, so what brought you to historical fiction? Well, it was more like historical fiction dragged me kicking and screaming into their realm. <laughs> so all I wanted to do was write a, a story that was um, loosely based on my parents' lives because they lived in an interesting era, the uh, Japanese colonization period of Korea and uh, in the early 20th century. So, you know, my parents were older when I was born, um, but, and also I'm older, so my parents, you know, lived that long ago. So even though I'm trying to tell a story that's pretty close to me, it's history. <laughs> well, it's one generation past, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it is, but it, it's more like two generations past, really. And at my age, now it's three generations past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that story found me, and then the second book was an offshoot of that story. So we were we had advanced into the fifties and the sixties, but it was still that would still be considered historical fiction according to our loose definition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, How about you? You know, it's funny. I I don't have a good answer for why, except for that it's the it's the type of story I love to read. Maybe because. I like, I like literary fiction. I like stories that help us grapple with the issues that we're dealing with today. And I think there's a sort of magic to placing those issues in the past that lets us address them or look at them and question them in a way that feels almost more approachable than if we place that same question, like say of female ambition, which is one of the themes of my first book. By placing it in the 17th century, I feel like I was able to almost be a little bit more objective about it in some ways than if I were writing about say my own life, which would then be fraught with so much of the, the baggage that we carry today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's uh, maybe my answer would be it's a combination of both that it's just fun and also it's intellectually satisfying. Yeah, I also think that by um, what you're saying is displacing an idea from contemporary times into the past, it helps to when you create that character, um, you can you have the advantage because it's fiction of highlighting um, those aspects that you wouldn't be able to have highlighted back then. 
but you can now. And, and yeah. so, so that makes the story double layered in a way that's very interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, since we're speaking to a number of writers who are hopefully either writing historical fiction or considering historical fiction, a lot of times uh, some of the questions that I'm sure you've gotten and that I've gotten is how much research do you have to do in order to to make your story true? How much history do you have to put in that fiction? Do you have a particular recipe for that? There's no recipe. Oh my God, if I had a recipe, it wouldn't have taken me 15 years to write that first book. <laughs> well, that's what makes it art, right? It's not art if there's not blood, sweat, and tears poured in. I don't know if it's just persistence or just stubbornness or whatever. Yeah. But the research is, I think it's um, not about how much, but how do you balance the amount of research that you have to do with the, with the story that you're trying to tell? Like, when do you stop researching? Yeah. Uh, oh I my think gosh, so when do you stop researching? <laughs> I don't think you ever do, especially now with the internet. It's right there. You just ask a question. It's so easy. Yeah. yeah. Almost deceptively easy, though, right? Deceptively easy, yeah. yeah. That's right. But, uh, yeah, you can find things on the internet. And yet, I, I find in the end, at least from my research, that I've gotten a lot more out of other books. Maybe it's just my generational preference as well as my personality. But um, I often use the internet as a launching off point. And then if I could only turn my screen here and show you the rest of my bookshelf filled with research books that uh, in some ways or others have helped inform the novels. Right. It's definitely not a, a winning balance, I think, in terms of an investment, like the number of books that I had to, to read and to buy in order to produce one fiction novel. Yeah, right. I feel like it doesn't work out in our favor. No, <laughs> no I think the number probably hits the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, uh, I don't want to speak for you, but at least I'm a pretty huge nerd. And so the chance to dive into the research is part of the delight. Yeah, it is. It is definitely part of the joy of the yeah. world. And then um, the other thing about research is that um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, well, you know, something that I've seen come up a lot in chat boards and, and conversations and in conferences too about historical fiction is how how true what if what if i find out that the the characters did something on day one of my story but i actually need it to happen on day five you know how much latitude does a fiction author have to change that how much obligation do we have to historical fact maybe it's another way of putting it what's your philosophy on that um i think that if the character is fictional you can do a lot you can you can just um, because you know you're creating a character, so that's a whole new person. But you have to be um, you have to be aware of the the culture of the time, not just the era, but of the country and um, uh, of the mores of that whole period. Uh, and then and then that character has to exist and resist against those um, that surrounding information that they would have. So, so um, I remember what I was going to say about research because this is relevant. The, the best research that I did were books that were written during the period that my book was set in. So, so that was, so I could hear the language of the, of the era in, in English, yes, but still it's, you know, it's, um, it was different. And then also see the way that things were regarded and, and that's not something you can read, you can find in a encyclopedia or online. It's, it's a, more of a sensibility about um, what the period was like. And so when you put your character in that period, you have a better sense of how that character would react to all yeah. the things around them. That's yeah, it's, so yeah. fun. it's so much fun to, to play with that interaction of history and character, yeah. I've found um, when I read books written in the time period that I'm writing about um, that it's it's both helpful and also illuminating in the sense that it also shows me where my modern concerns are, you know, the parts where I feel out of sync with mm -hmm. perhaps a 1930s novel 
because it doesn't fit my sensibilities that highlights to me the modern and contemporary biases that I'm coming to the story that maybe I don't want to leave out and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but as a, a writer, I think you want to be aware of both what you're bringing from the modern period and then what you're connecting to from the past. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, I see our role as being bridge builders in a way because I mean, nobody needs me to travel back in time and write a novel written in the 1930s. Right. Uh, people wrote those. If we wanted to read them, we would. Yeah. Um, what we're doing is bringing contemporary readers to the 1930s or to the 1950s or whatever. Right. Uh, so that we can all, like I was saying earlier, sort of be entertained, but also grapple with our own contemporary issues. Right. But it's interesting that you say when you read the, some of the older tomes, you know, you're aware of your bias in, in responding to that text, especially uh, maybe even, especially, you know, linguistically. And so, so that gives you um, an advantage because you're speaking to a contemporary audience. So you know where your biases lie and then so you can deal with that in the creation of your work. Right. So, yeah. yeah, I think the, the question of diction is something that every historical novelist has to deal with and, you know, more extreme the further back you go, but, um, you know, do, do you use modern slang? Do you translate um, syntax to sound contemporary or do you leave it sounding archaic? Yeah. So, interesting issues. And you add, when you add the layer of it's supposed to be spoken in a different language, you know, because my novel takes place entirely in Korea and you're speaking Korean, you know, except for when they speak English. And when I have to, when they do that, I have to say they said in English, you know, because <laughs> otherwise that's the exception, out. right? Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So um, I remember um, I was typing something about the grandfather was thinking and the word, you know, he was thinking about lifestyle. And then I thought, now that doesn't sound like, that sounds like a contemporary word, you know? So I did do the etymology on that and it was, you know, 20 years after, after that. So, uh, yeah, that's so, great. so you don't know, and you have to really listen to your instinct and be immersed in the period, which is why the research is so important so that you can reach a place where you are immersed. Yeah. You know, and you have that sensitivity. Absolutely. For my first novel, in, uh, which is about a 17th century female painter, Judith Leister. Um, in a, an early draft of it, I talked about her studio, her painting studio. And a, um, another writer who's also written about artists said, you know, I think that's a 19th century term. So I looked at etymology online. Um, I think it's the website is ETMY online. I think if any of you historical writers want to look it up, and you know, sure enough, she was right. That was not a 17th century word. It was a 19th century word. And then rethinking that helped me co sort of conceptualize how we thought of artists in different ways. Mm -hmm. In the 17th century, it was actually really a business. So she called it a workshop. Right. She did work there. And this work was to be sold, um, whereas the atelier of, the, of Paris in the 19th century and the studio idea that came out of that was a much more rarefied notion. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, so a single word can... Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, but, you know, for, for writers out there, I would say don't let that stuff paralyze you either. I think it yeah. can be terrifying to feel like you're going to get something wrong. And I mean, we all get stuff wrong, but what does that mean, right? It's a fictional universe. Yeah, and, and also this is stuff that you'll catch in revision. So you certainly shouldn't be thinking about it in the creative process. Absolutely. It's hard enough as it is. So. so speaking of things we should or shouldn't be thinking about, um, what sort of advice would you give yourself if you could travel back in time um, to, you know, 15 years earlier when you started that novel? Oh, man. Yeah, I don't, I don't, well, I think that I would have told me that um, it was going to, it was going to be fine. It was going to all work out, you know, in a way that would make me happy. And so, you know, but don't start work. Don't start, stop working as hard as you are. <laughs> Just know that, <laughs> that it's going to be okay because the anxiety of writing and not knowing, you know, if you're writing into the vacuum or not is, is a huge thing. So, yeah. yeah, I think there's an important balance between fear and self-confidence um, and that fear can actually be a great driver 
to yeah. making you return to the work again and again. Um, yeah, I mean, I think my advice to myself would actually be at the earlier stages. Um, you know, a first draft is not a final draft. Yeah. <laughs> Keep revising. Um, right. A Light of Her Own was the fifth novel length manuscript that I wrote and um, I had started querying a number three and I wasn't ready. You know, that mm -hmm. manuscript number three wasn't even close to ready. And, you know, so maybe that gauntlet is just part of the learning process. But yeah. I think that's what I would tell myself. Um, don't be afraid to revise and yeah. revise and revise. It's worth it. Yeah, I had a friend, a writing friend, and we asked each other, you know, how many revisions do you think you did until you got to your book, you know? <laughs> and the number we came up with was around 100. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard for me to count. That's the only thing that gives me yeah. pause because you know, we don't live in Hemingway's time where we've got a manuscript and then you throw it out to type up a new one. So it's yeah. going to be a little hard when you're dabbling in and out. Yeah. But yeah, that, that sounds right. I would probably guess for a light of her own, it was maybe 60, but that's just off the top of my head. Yeah, that sounds right to me too. Yeah. I think we compromised. I think I said 60 and I think you said, you know, 200. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> He's an essayist, so uh, okay. Different too, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it, it's all different. Mm -hmm. It's all different. Do you think that when you got to your second book, that your process was a little bit more refined? Um, I don't know if refined is the is the right word um, because it feels so sloppy. The process feels so sloppy. <laughs> so what is what is your process? <laughs> if you don't mind sharing. No, it's you know you get to the page and you and you try to think of a scene, you try to think of what your characters would do and why, and and um, and how it fits into what's happening that in that day, you know, in that period, and, um, and what kinds of things they would do is hard enough to come up with. So, yeah, so I don't know, fiction is so hard, I don't know why I write it. <laughs> And yet, I'll bet you wouldn't give it up, right? No, I wouldn't give it up. <laughs> yeah, so, I know. So, yeah, and mostly it's about whenever I can get to the page, um, I really try to focus. But, you know, I teach also, and so there's that distraction, and then there's uh, the distraction of the pandemic, and then, you know, there's just always distractions. And so I don't have a, um, a schedule or a system but I do go to my office every day and open the document. Uh-huh, every day. Every day. So I'll open I may only read a sentence, you know, one day, but another day I'll write five pages, you know, so. Yeah. When you're beginning a project, um, do you have a, do you have an outline? Do you do all the research first? Do you mix it up? I do some research on ERA first so that I know uh, so I had come in with something, you know, uh, I know what, what, like, I don't want to set it on the day that something explosive happened and, you know, and my character doesn't even pay attention to it. So, so, so I do a little bit of research, um, but I'll already have a story idea. So that will give me the setting. So usually I'll have character and setting and then the situation. And then, so, um, and so that's, that's the triangle I think that I work with, which is why setting is so important because it's one of the three elements that, you know, that I kind of struggle with in harmony. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think probably a lot of historical fiction writers and readers likewise love setting. And that's partly what draws us mm -hmm. to the genre. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is your process? Um, it's, it's similar in that I usually start with a really vague idea of, okay, so for the first novel, I want to write something about Judith Leister. And for the second novel, I want to write something about this American woman, Millie Bennett, who went to Russia. And then, you know, I just sort of go through the research feeling blindly and collecting notes and looking for something that might come into a, into the shape of a story. Um, and 
it's, you know, it's usually a lot of research, a couple months at least of just researching before I can even start to think like maybe I could shape this into a story. And each time I write a novel, which now I've finished, I just finished what would be my seventh now novel length manuscript. And um, each time I'm like, okay, this time I'm going to plot it out the whole thing ahead of yeah. time. But it doesn't <laughs> mean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, God bless the people who can. I'm tremendously jealous of you. <laughs> you know, Eugenia, I, I heard someone say that uh, Amor Towles, who wrote A Gentleman in Moscow and um, what was the other one? Uh, Rules for Civility, he apparently for A Gentleman in Moscow said that he spent two years outlining it and then wrote it in like six weeks. <laughs> right. So he was thinking about it solidly for two years. So that's yeah. a whole different way of, of writing. Yeah. Yeah, it totally is. And you can feel it in that book. It's like reading a piece of clockwork that every single little thing clicks together. And mm -hmm. I really admire that. Um, that is unfortunately not anything I'm going to be capable of. No, me neither. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I think that's the beauty too of this because it's art that everybody does this in their own way, yeah. in their own shape. And so every single person listening to this is also going to have their own method and that's all totally legitimate. Right, exactly. There is no right way. There never has been. Yeah. Know. But it's yeah. been interesting just to watch Hemingway to see, um, you know, what he, what his process was. He was diligent. He was stubborn at the desk, you know, so everyone, yeah. that, that's good discipline. Which is funny because I think people looking at his persona wouldn't necessarily assume he was such a hard worker. Mm -hmm. Right. But he had produced a lot of work. So it's because he was working all the time, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so having the, the persistence, like you said earlier, to stick with it is so important. Yeah. Um, I want to, you, you're reminding me now of something I had wanted to mention earlier about um, one sort of mental epiphany I had about my, my process, um, or actually more my mental and emotional relationship to my process um, was, I think it was, for the fifth manuscript, which is the, actually the one that ended up getting published, I just got to a point where I was like, I'm, I'm not going to get published anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's fine because nothing will stop me from writing. I am going to keep enjoying this process. And so I almost felt like I had, you know, passed through hell and entered purgatory that like I had my epiphany and I realized, and then, you know, I swear it was like two weeks later that I got an offer from an agent. It was almost wow. as if the universe were saying like, you need to get your priorities straight um, <laughs> and then we'll talk, yeah. so, you know, and, but that's still the, that is the bedrock for me that even if I am ever able to publish another novel again, I'm going to keep writing. That's right. I know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I haven't been writing that long. So, you know, um, I can't say that if I stop writing, and also I'm getting older, so it's getting a little harder to write. Um, I mean, I remember the story about somebody compared an Agatha Christie novel from when she was, you know, in her prime, and then when she was in her late 60s and 70s. Huh. And the vocabulary dropped from the thousands to the hundreds. Oh my gosh. Yeah, well, that's so, a little yeah, somebody did a little comparison. So that, I live with that fear, that constant fear that, you know, um, that, that do I even have another novel in me? Oh, well, I'm sure that's not a question. I know you do because yeah. you told me what you're working on. Um, but and we would all be lucky to be Agatha Christie. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> even with the drop from thousands. Yes, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But that's a, that's a admirable position to have Carrie to, um, you know, know that no matter that, that you're writing really for yourself, even though, of course, the publishing part is, is key to it as well, but, you know, the passion is always going to be there no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it helps to sort of acknowledge where that division lies in ourselves emotionally, that there's the art process and then there's the commercial process. Mm -hmm. And um, they might combine into one book, but they are still separate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's an important distinction. Yeah. 
definitely. So we're almost at the end of our time. We've got about two more minutes, I think. Um, is there anything else you want to say about, about history or advice for writing? Mm, I think the, the um, no, I think that the, the key, the, the thing that I'm struggling with these days is, is, am, am I, is it time to stop researching, you know, and just even turn off the browser, just turn it off and just go for it. Because I remember that kind of immersion before, the, before there was this robust internet, you know, when the internet was really clumsy. And so you wouldn't do that. Um, and, and I think the concentration was better then. So, yeah, I think, so I think that, um, you know, I'm at that balance where, okay, that I'm turning it all off. And I'm going to write by hand now. And I think sometimes that's helpful. Yeah, how do you know when you've reached that point, that sort of research saturation? Yeah, I think it's when you realize you're not being productive and you're spending a lot of time <laughs> looking and not doing, uh -huh. <laughs> shopping yeah. but not buying. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it, shopping and not buying. I like that. I think for me, I can tell when I'm researching things that are like less than one sentence, really, you know, if what I'm looking up is like the name of a street or how a doorknob works, like, I could probably figure that out later. And who knows, <laughs> that session or that part of the book might not even be there. Like, you know, uh, for the first, for the light of her own, I remember I spent hours, hours trying to figure out how somebody would light a lantern in 17th century Netherlands, uh, Holland, and um, and then I cut that whole scene, so it didn't matter. <laughs> Nobody lit the lantern. The lantern was just lit already, and it didn't need to be shown. It was, so after that, I was like, all right, there's, there's a bar at which we need to stop here. <laughs> That's a great example. <laughs> Love so it. Sad. Um, but you know, the research is part of the fun. So that's, yeah, you know, since at is. least for me, the, you know, I want to emphasize enjoying the process. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing the research and I'll keep doing it. But when you start to get that sneaking suspicion that it's time to move on, uh -huh. it's probably something yeah. to listen to. Yeah. All right. Well, Eugenia, hold up your books again, please. Okay. I'll hold up the, the two most recent versions, The Calligrapher's Daughter and The Kinship of Secrets. Thank Great. you. Thank you. And they're beautiful books. Everyone check them out. Uh, these are mine. Um, I'm on Twitter, so ordinarily we do some kind of Q&A, but we're not able to do that right now. So if you have any questions you want to send to me on social media, please do that. And I'm sure Eugenia won't mind if you reach out in her channels yeah. too. I'm on Twitter too. Oh, great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night or good day. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. <laughs>
Um, thank you all for attending um, on this Friday. I put together some slides to go through the residency process. So I'm going to share my screen now. Perfect. And let me get my own setup organized so I can see some of you along the bottom that still see my screen and the chat to the side, just in case anything um, urgent pops up. Although when I'm talking, I can't always be, uh, I can't always be chatting, um, but I'll look over uh, every so often. So um, on residencies, what we're going to talk about today are um, what a residency is and why you might want to go on one. Um, where to go and how to decide, how to apply, what to do while you're there, and then negotiating re-entry once it's over, um, because residencies are kind of a wonderful fantasy land for writers, and sometimes getting back to your regular life, no matter how lovely it is, um, can be kind of a shock. So I'm going to um, go through these subjects, and then we'll have some time to talk at the end. If you have a question, um, something goes wrong, or you have a question that needs to be answered immediately, um, you can um, raise your hand or ask in the chat. Maybe one of the volunteers can break in and interrupt me if need be. Otherwise, I'd ask that you save your questions um, until the end, and then I'll be, I'll be very happy to answer them. We're also gonna take a little bit of a break in about 10 or 15 minutes so that Jenny can talk to people about the agent uh, pitching and visiting process. So I'll try to find a nice time to pause and then we will, we will jump back into um, wherever we need to be. So um, what is and why go on a residency? There are as many reasons for this as there are writers, but a residency or an artist colony is a place to go to write with a group of other writers and artists. Um, you usually get a room and or a studio to yourself and that's it. There's usually no formal required activities, no performance reports or check-ins, no classes, no workshops. It's just you and the time and space to write. Sometimes when I've tried to explain this to non-writers, they get very confused about this. They're like, well, it's like a conference. It's like, well, not really. Well, it's like a seminar, not really that either. Basically, you usually have a bedroom and a workroom and sometimes food and that's it. And they think that is very strange, but I don't think anyone who's attending this session would find it that odd um, at all. So residency structures vary depending on where you are, but these are the basics. It's time and space for you to focus on your writing. So why go on a residency? Um, you might go on a residency to get away from work and family, to have dedicated writing time. You might decide to go on a residency because you want to focus on a particular project and you don't want any distractions. You just want to really be zeroed in on that. You might go just to refresh your creative practice. Maybe you've had a lull, maybe you're between projects. You want something sort of, um, something different, um, something perhaps inspirational. You might go on a residency to connect with other writers and artists. Um, part of the joys of our residency is being with a bunch of like-minded people that you can be social with at meals or by arrangement, um, usually in the evening, so you can see how other people are tackling their, uh, their projects, how they're living this particular kind of creative life. You might also go on a residency to explore a different climate or culture. Maybe this has to do with the project that you're working on, or maybe you're just curious. Um, you want to um, live in Wyoming for uh, a couple of weeks. That's a picture there of you cross in Wyoming. Or you might go on a residency just to see what it's like. You're curious, is this something for you? You wanna try it out um, and, see, and see what's what. So how to decide where to go. Um, this is a great site to search. The Alliance of Artists Communities, which is kind of an awkward mouthful, um, but here you can search um, residencies by area, by, uh, by art form, by region, um, all different kinds of things. So I'm going to put that link um, in the chat because I recognize that you can't click from, um, from your screen, but I just put the link in the chat. So you can check out uh, the Alliance of Artist Communities to find um, possible places to go that are near you, that are far away that are specifically for fiction writers or specifically for poets, ones that you have to pay for, ones that are fully funded, um, all, my, all different possibilities, but it's a wonderful site um, to search. 
So another thing to consider is location. Where do you want to go for a residency? Um, do you need a change of scene for your work or just for yourself? Again, maybe you're researching a particular place for a writing project and you want to live on an island um, in the Pacific Northwest, which is where Hedgebrook is, um, where that picture is from. Or do you just want a change of scene for yourself to refresh yourself and hopefully your creative pro uh, process? Another question to ask is, does your budget allow for higher transportation costs flying instead of driving? Certainly there are benefits to residencies far away, including overseas. But one thing that you should also consider is packing because going on a residency isn't necessarily like going on a vacation. You might, to bring, you might need to bring a lot of materials with you. You might need to pack a lot of books with you. So um, you might want to bring a guitar or something like that. Many different possibilities. We'll talk a little bit more about um, what to bring later. Um, but think about, can you pack all the things you need if you fly? Or would it better for this particular project or season or time in your writing life to load up a car and drive there? Another thing to consider is if the residency is fully funded, meaning you don't have to pay for anything, or if it's what I call pay to play, where you do pay a particular rate, uh, usually it's a daily rate, sometimes it's, um, it's a weekly rate. So getting into a fully funded residency is great, but they're usually highly competitive, they're more difficult to get into, and they're not always flexible when it comes to scheduling. If you pay to play, so to speak, at a place like the Porches in Virginia or Dairy Hollow in Arkansas, you have much more flexibility. I think of places like this as very quiet and usually very charming hotels for writers. Um, I have not been to Dairy Hollow, but I have been to the Porches. And it's basically like a five room bed and breakfast, but you, you bring your own breakfast for writers. Um, beautiful rooms, lovely views in, a, in an old um, house in the Virginia countryside. So paying to play um, is, uh, is a great option, especially if you're looking for um, flexibility in scheduling. And at these places, you still get the benefit of being with other writers, if that's what you're after. Um, so at mealtimes or at designated social times, when you're sort of encouraged to be social, only if you want to, um, you can bond with other writers, talk to them about their process, ask them questions, be asked questions, have that kind of connection, that really deep conversation that seems to happen so easily and so beautiful at different residencies. So another thing to consider with a residency is the size. Um, I have a picture of VCCA, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts uh, here. They're a relatively large residency, usually with about 25 artists, uh, writers and composers in residence um, at one time. At a bigger residency, there's more of a chance to find your people uh, if, if that's what you're, you're looking for. Um, and there's likely more diversity in terms of everything, age, race, class, et cetera, as well as what kind of artist is there. Um, so poets, composers, painters, digital artists, et cetera. A smaller residency can be cozy, but one difficult person can really change the experience. Also, if you're not really there for a lot of um, social connection, if, you're, if you really wanna embed with a project, sometimes a larger residency also gives you more of a chance to hide out. Um, people aren't necessarily, if, if you're there with only four other people, it's gonna be noticed if you are missing in action. Um, people shouldn't comment on this or make a big deal about it, but if you really just wanna sort of pull up and focus on your work, a larger residency can be a great place um, to do that because there's so much other stuff going on um, your participation is not ever necessary, but it's usually not, not missed either. And of course, I mean that in the nicest possible way. Other things to consider for residencies are so-called amenities. Um, what are the accommodations? Do you get your own room? Do you get your own cabin? And I have a picture here of a cabin um, at Hambage, which is in, um, which is in Georgia. Um, certainly, a question to ask is, um, is the residency accessible? Um, will you be able to move around the way you need to move around um, at this particular place? Are meals provided or do you bring your own food? That can vary greatly. 
Um, some residencies, all meals are provided, some none are provided, and others only serve particular meals. At Hamage, I think it was um, only dinners on weekdays. So for other meals and on weekends, you were on your own with food, although they definitely encouraged you to um, take leftovers back with you um, to your separate cabins. Another thing to consider, will you have access to a kitchen, fridge, electric tea kettle, et cetera? Is there help with transportation or is it better for you to bring your own car? And a big question, is there Wi-Fi, which can be a deal breaker for some and not for others. Um, Hambage did not have Wi-Fi except at the main house. So at all the cabins, there was no Wi-Fi. And um, since it was in a relatively isolated patch in Northern Georgia, there was no cell service either. So if you really want to hole up with a bunch of books and um, you know, pens and notebooks and your laptop and really get work done, um, that can be wonderful not to have that distraction. However, if you depend on the internet for research for a particular project, you definitely want to know if there's going to be Wi-Fi um, going in um, or not. Another thing to consider when you are choosing where to apply for a residency is tier. So there are very fancy residencies and there are kind of rustic residencies and then there are residencies that fall in between. So some of the most high end and competitive residencies are places like Yaddo, McDowell and Hedgebrook. And I have a picture of the gorgeous Yaddo um, mansion. I believe they even call it there. So this can be very alluring, and I'm sure residents of, these cal of this caliber are quite lovely. However, fancier is not always better. Um, you might get your own cabin, lunch delivered in a picnic basket, and the thrill of listing it on your CV, but the atmosphere can be competitive. And I just want to know, as with any residency, your mileage may vary. Um, you never know who's going to be there when you were there. Um, I've been on many residencies and I've never had a completely dud or bad experience. Um, but sometimes um, with fancier residencies, the atmosphere can be more competitive. And I'll talk a little bit more about later under the category of um, what to do when you're actually there. Another thing to consider is that the application fees for places like this, which are sometimes $50 a pop, um, can add up. So you might need to apply more selectively to the higher end, more competitive and fancier residencies, because if you tried, um, I don't know, a few of them a year, uh, that could add up. Also, um, Yaddo and McDowell only take applications from you every other year. So if you apply and you don't get in, you need to wait uh, a year off before you can apply again. So that's something to consider um, with these as well. Another thing to consider is the do-it-yourself option, um, where you go to a hotel, um, a cabin in a national park, an Airbnb, et cetera. Um, the pros to this are you control everything about the residency, where you go, when you go, how long you go for. And you also control who comes with you. Um, maybe you and some writing friends decide to rent a beach house in Rehoboth on the shoulder season and have a, a do-it-yourself writing residency. I think that control and knowledge going in is definitely a plus, but there won't be unexpected writer connections that often happen at residencies. Some of the cons um, are that um, you pay for it yourself. Uh, as far as I know, there are no fully funded DIY residencies unless you, unless you get a grant um, to use for that purpose. You are either by yourself or with a known group of writers, which is kind of pro or con, and there's no prestige factor if that matters. Um, if you're trying to build an academic career, it might matter. But the bottom line is, if it's mostly time and flexibility that you're after, go for it. The do-it-yourself residency is a wonderful option. Um, the next part that we are heading into is the how to apply part. Um, and the writing sample is the most important part of your application. So you want to follow the application's guidelines to the letter. Whatever they ask for, give it to them exactly how they ask for it. If they want a 25-page writing sample, don't think it's okay that you can sneak to 27. 
don't think it's okay that you can give them just three. Stay within the page ranges, um, format it however they want it to. Don't give them any reason to reject you because you didn't title your PDF properly or something like that. Uh, the other piece of advice that I have, and this is fairly obvious, but choose your strongest work. And if it's a work in progress that they ask for, or you want to give them a work in progress that you're going to be working on, make sure it's polished. Um, it can't be a super rough draft with notes that say more here and things like that. You want to give them um, your best possible work for them to make this decision. And then there is uh, the artist statement or the statement of purpose. So some applications ask for a statement. It could be what you plan to work on while you're there, which is pretty straightforward. Or it could be an artist statement, which can be tricky. Um, writers who have struggled with the artist statement um, might be wincing um, with, uh, with memories of how difficult uh, this can be to do because there's no uniform guidelines like what is <laughs> an artist statement. I see wincing happening in the chat. Um, I still have a bit of a shudder. However, I found this wonderful thing that I'm going to copy and paste in the chat for you so you can link to it um, easily. And it was, um, it was a how-to guide um, written by Molly Gordon, how to write an artist statement with creativity and integrity. And she uses uh, a stew metaphor, which is why I have pictures of stew in the making at the side. Um, but she, she really breaks down the process and has you write in different stages. So first you just write stuff. That's like the ingredients for the stew. And then she takes you through prompts that help you put that together into a cohesive artist statement. So I tried doing this um, when I applied to the Malay colony, which is a, a fairly, um, a fairly fancy residency. And uh, I was a relatively new writer. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I followed these instructions and I wrote an artist statement that uh, was really true to me and my work. And it, um, and it, it went beautifully, I got in. So um, if you read this and it feels a little hokey to you, um, give it some, like try it anyway, at least as an experiment, because it can really help you think about your work in a loose way instead of just sitting down to say, I'm going to write a perfect artist statement right now. So the link is in the chat and I definitely recommend um, taking a look at that. Hey, Randon, I'm gonna uh, interrupt for just a second right now. Of course. Um, everybody is getting weird invitations uh, back to rooms that they have already been in today. I apologize for that. We closed the rooms and then opened them back up again and when you do that, uh, rooms that you are still showing up as being part of in, uh, automatically invite you to come back in. So please ignore the invitations that you're seeing right now. Um, we are going to be starting to send invites out for the two o'clock sessions right at two o'clock. So I may have to I may have to interrupt you again to give that announcement again, but just I know a lot of people are going what I already saw that person. Yes, you have. So uh, uh, wait, you should be getting your invitation to your next appointment at two o'clock and that's the one that you should accept. So thank you and back to random. <laughs> Great. No problem, Jenny. And please interrupt again if you need to at five minutes before two. Um, I'm happy to. Uh, I'm happy to hear a voice and uh, and hit pause. Okay. So we talked about the artist statement. Uh, the question of letters of recommendation. This can be another kind of cringy, cringy moment. Um, these can be very easy to get or they can be very annoying depending on where you are in your writing career and how you've gone about it. So I'm gonna give you a few options. But first, let me say, the purpose of a letter of recommendation is usually just to tell the residency two main things. One, you're serious about your work and two, that you play well with others because the residency people, if they don't know you, have no idea um, who you are. Uh, they can read your writing sample, they can look at your resume or CV, which is great, but they don't know um, very much about who you are as a person. And so they usually want um, a letter to speak to the seriousness of your work. And then they want another letter that will talk about your merits as a person. Basically, do you play well with others? Will you be respectful of other people's writing time, etc.? 
So people that you might ask are current or former teachers and professors. These can be college and university professors in an MFA program. They could be community writing center um, teachers, like um, classes of politics and prose or the writer center or something like that. But someone that can speak to your work. Also, you might ask a current or former editor of your work. Um, this could be someone that you corresponded with back and forth about a piece of yours that was published in a literary magazine, someone who can speak to you being um, a decent person uh, going through the editing process and being serious about your work. If you are lucky enough to have a writing mentor, um, that's a wonderful person to ask. Um, if you have writing friends, especially if they've been to the residency you're applying for, they're good people to ask because they can talk about the seriousness of your work. If you're writing friends, you've talked about your work, you've talked about um, the forums that you're writing in, you've had conversations about the writing life in general, and your friend can um, let the residency know what kind of person you would be, um, if you'd be respectful, if you'd be interested in you know, sharing your knowledge with others, et cetera. You can also ask your employer, especially if you are not really plugged in to a writing community right now. Um, I did my MFA a very long time ago and in a different genre than what I write in now. Um, so I have no current or former teachers or professors to ask. Um, so I've asked editors, um, I've asked writing friends, um, and uh, I also um, I'm also kind of a loner when it comes to writing, and maybe you are too. So um, that can be difficult to, again, not to be plugged in firmly to a writing community. So I hope that this broader list of possible people to ask will help regardless of what kind of stage in your writing career you are, regardless of what path you've taken up until now, but this can be a range of people to ask. Another question that comes up in the application is choosing dates. And so you should think about how long do you want to be away from home? And then a question that might have a very different answer, which is how long can you be away from home? Um, I will say longer isn't always better, but again, this completely depends on um, your work life and personality uh, situation. So the longest time that I've spent at a residency was a month and my shortest was a three day weekend. And during the month, I wound up getting really stuck in the middle. Um, I just, uh, I lost motivation. I felt like I had all the time in the world while I was there. So I, I kind of fooled around and then lost my, my drive. But during the three-day weekend um, in December at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, I wound up ordering my entire essay collection, which is no small thing. So in just those three days, and I think only one day was a full day and two days were shoulder days, um, I was really energized, I was pressured in the best possible way, and I got a ton done. So if it is hard for you to take time away from work or family or other commitments you've made, don't discount a residency. Um, if you think about it a little in advance, if you're really motivated when you get there, you can get a whole lot done in those hours devoted entirely to your writing. My sweet spot is 10 days to two weeks. For me, that's kind of the ideal length of time. But again, it's different for it's different for everyone. So I just offer the short and long perspective um, as a bit of possible advice. And now we get to a note about packing. Um, this is incredibly subjective, but I would think in advance about how you like to spend your writing time at home and what you need around you while you are doing it. So my must brings, and this is entirely my own opinion is first of all, all of your writing supplies, laptop, notebooks, pens, cords, um, books for projects that you're working on, if you have to do any kind of research and also books for fun. For me, coffee and tea is a complete necessity to have on hand at all times and a range of snacks, um, some healthy snacks and some treat snacks. I find that I'm putting out so much energy when I'm at a residency, even if all I'm doing is sitting at a desk, that's all my physical body is doing. But I find that I'm starving all the time. And if it's a residency where the food is provided, it's always possible that some meal is gonna go wrong for you, it's too spicy, or you just can't abide, um, I don't know, a certain, a certain kind of, of food for dinner, et cetera. So having a range of snacks for me is definitely a necessity. 
Also, never underestimate the power of either a bag of Cheetos or a bag of microwave popcorn to save an otherwise declining afternoon. I recommend those two things in particular. Um, a couple of odd things that I would recommend to pack that you can bring, and again, this is completely individual, is uh, a sleeping bag or a pretty throw or a hot water bottle if it's winter, because sometimes you don't have full climate control over your space and filling up a pink old fashioned hot water bottle with super hot tap water and putting it at the foot of your bed can really make a difference for your night of sleep. You might consider bringing bug spray and or a small fan if it's summer. Um, I'm also gonna say clothes you feel good in, however you define that. Occasionally I've gone on a residency and I've just packed at the last minute and I thought I'm there to write, I'm not gonna care what I'm gonna look like at all. And then I got there and I did care and I didn't have any of the clothes that I wanted. So bring clothes that you feel good in, whatever that means to you. And kind of randomly a box of tissues. I don't know why, but when I'm ever, I'm in a room away from home and writing, I seem to always miss having a box of tissues. Whenever I go on a residency, I keep a running list of things I wish I had brought. So the next time is always a little bit better. So if you go on residencies more than once, I remember I felt the, last, the lack of a tissue box, so I popped that on the list. Or I was really chilly at night for one week, so um, I put the hot water bottle on my list. So if you know you're gonna be going back to a particular residency or to another residency, you might make a note at the end of your time there to, um, to remind yourself what you wish you had brought um, so that you can do that next time. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is what to do while you're there. Jenny, do you need a few minutes just to talk with people about um, entering and leaving agent rooms? If not, I'll keep going for a little bit. But if that conversation needs to happen, please pop right back in and, uh, and interrupt. And I'm happy to pause to make sure everyone gets to where they, they need to go. Okay, then I'll continue. Uh, actually, I'll tell you what, I'm sorry. I was in with uh, an agent try, trying to get her audio to work. Oh, of course. So we are, uh, if there are agents who are just joining us, we are trying to move you into your breakout room. Um, and if you are uh, pitchers who are gonna start pitching at two, we are gonna try to get you in there just as quickly as possible. Again, as with the morning, if something happens and you're shorted a little bit of time, we'll try to make up for that uh, one way or the other. Um, but uh, we're just trying to get agents into their rooms at two to, to start you guys off. So um, just give us a couple seconds and we should be able to get everybody at two o'clock in. So we have a, we have a couple more minutes. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Randon and we'll try to get everybody kicked off at two. All right, thanks so much. So back to what to do while you're actually at the residency. Um, I recommend before you go to make a mixed list, and the mixed part is important, of things to do before you go. And this list can include um, big work, um, whatever your major project is, writing your short stories, outlining your novel, ordering a poetry collection, whatever your sort of big and official work is um, for But I also recommend that you Put some smaller work things on the list, um, light revisions that you might want to do to something, reading towards a particular project, sketching a book review you promised you'd write, or indexing a journal. Some of these might be big projects, but they might be smaller too. And then on that mixed list, I really recommend um, fun things, uh, reading a novel that has nothing to do with your work, um, looking at art books, bringing a sketchbook, um, playing ukulele, um, if that's something that you can do without disturbing other writers, that part, of course, is, uh, is very important. Another thing that I strongly suggest that you do um, while you're there is to make time for rest and play. Um, you might want to read Patricia Hampel's wonderful book, The Art of the Wasted Day, or Louise DeSalvo's book, The Art of Slow Writing. 
um, both of these books uh, prom um, really promote taking time to um, waste time. I put that in quotes because it's not waste as in throwing it away. The etymology of the word waste actually comes from a word that meant uncultivated. So wasteland was just uncultivated land. So you might spend some time at a residency not cultivating, not writing, not always trying to do, um, but resting, putting um, stuff in instead of always trying to output. You might also take a little time to explore the area you're in, to drive out to get donuts, to spend an afternoon thrifting, to take a hike to that nearby mountaintop, take a walk on the beach, take a nap, etc. So um, if you're new to residencies, don't feel like you have to spend every possible minute being productive. Um, because that usually turns out not to be productive at all. And uh, this brings me to uh, the uh, golden rule of residencies that I have, and that is whatever you do on a residency that you cannot do at home counts towards your work there. So this could be hanging out with poets after dinner, staying up late to look at the stars, having conversations, eating junk food, having a responsible drink or three, skipping showers, taking naps, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that you can do on a residency that you can't do at home, as long as it doesn't disturb anyone else there or break the rules of the residency, of course. But all of those happy things count towards, um, towards your time there and towards your work. So I would encourage you um, to feel good about those kinds of decisions that you might make um, while you were there. Also, I'd like you to keep in mind that this is your time to use as you like. Other writers should be respectful of this, and many residencies have rules that you can't visit another writer's studio unless expressly invited, so please obey that rule. Um, but if other people aren't respecting your time, speak up. Don't say yes to things that you don't want to do. If you're feeling unsocial or if you're on a great writing streak, feel free to hide out, sit by yourself at meals, skip an outing or a reading if it interferes with your work, and only say yes to things that you want to do. This is a time of healthy self-centeredness to really be thinking about your own process and your own work. And then a quick word about other residents. So for the most part, other residents are a source of inspiration, empathy, and happy conversation. I found that small talk at a residency often gets big really fast because you're all doing some version of the same creative thing. Pretty much every residency I've been on I've come away with a lasting friend that I've kept in touch with, um, artist friend, composer friends, filmmaker friends. Um, and it just is a really unique and fertile ground for communion between writers and artists. But occasionally, ego gets involved. Um, someone looks down on your art form, your particular MFA, your lack of a particular MFA, your publication history, your lack of publication history. The fact that you write by hand, that you don't use Scrivener, that you're a Libra, I mean, whatever. Um, occasionally, ego comes out. And my advice is try not to fret about this, but know in advance that this can happen so you're not caught off guard. And if it does happen, if someone starts jousting with you, which is why I have the fighting image on the side, and you know they're competitive and like, oh, you've been here, I've been there. Oh, you haven't published yet? I got published here. It happens occasionally. If it does, try not to let it get to you. Try to let that nonsense roll right off you. Um, you're there to write and not get tripped up in petty games of one-upmanship. So next time, sit at a different table. Next time, sit with a friend you've already made. Next time, sit by yourself if you want to. Um, and, uh, and just try to avoid that and not get, not get tripped up in that. For the last day of a residency, um, I, I try to avoid feeling panicky, like one more day, one more day, and then I have to go home and my life is not my anymore. So I like to use the last day for a combination of playing and planning. I like to think, where do I wanna take my work from here? Like I've done this amount of stuff. What do I want to do? What do I wanna do next? What do I want to do in a week? What do I want to do a month from now? Um, I'll speak more about planning in just a little minute. And the other thing that I like to do is play and have at least a morning or an afternoon on the last day be devoted to playing. So I might try some Linda Berry exercises. That's her book, Making Comics, um, in the picture there. 
where she has all kinds of wonderful writing and drawing prompts for people who do not consider themselves artists and may not consider themselves writers either. Um, I might doodle a comics version of whatever my major project was. I might try writing song lyrics or fooling around with a poem when I'm not in any way a poet. But to spend some time with creative play um, on that last day before I return to my regular life. And then comes reentry. Um, this can be tough. Um, maybe you are resentful at the demands that your life has on you. Um, my spouse and I once went to a residency together where all meals were served. And when we came home, we would almost wait each other out at mealtimes because neither of us wanted to cook anymore. So I'd be starving, but I'd be kind of waiting around and saying things like, oh, are you, are you getting hungry? Like I might make something, but not yet. And so try to have a little bit of a plan for when you come home. Um, you, might, uh, you might do this on the last day, or you might even think about this before you come. What will you do your first full day at home to try to keep the spirit of the residency alive? What will you do one week or one weekend later? You might make some notes on a calendar to sort of put reminders to yourself of things that you want to do so you don't lose that magic entirely. You kind of can't hang on to it really, um, but you can try to keep aspects of it um, alive longer to sort of extend that residency feeling. Um, if this is of interest to you, um, I have an essay and I'll link to it in the chat. You can read it on your own if it's of interest to you. Um, and it uh, was published on Brevity. It's called On Keeping a Writing Notebook or Three. And it's about keeping a journal, a writing notebook, and a writing planner. And the writing planner has a calendar page on one side and notebook paper on the other. And a picture, the picture on the side is the calendar side for one week that I did at VCCA in Virginia. And um, it's very dense because I did all kinds of things because I was away from home and I had all the time in the world. But what I might have done on that last day is flip ahead a couple pages and written some things to do the next weekend or a month later. Remember when you started this project at VCCA? Remember you took that great hike? Why don't you try the Billy Goat Trail? Why don't you try something else? Just to sort of have those little kind of stepping stones um, from a glorious residency experience to take you into the future of your sort of, um, I mean, it's inevitably more regular life. If you're living a residency life all the time, I commend you, but I don't, I don't know if it's possible. So um, I am very happy to take questions in the chat. I have the chat window open. I'll leave this up for just a, a minute. Um, and then I'll return, I'll stop screen sharing so we can all see each other a little bit. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions about the residency process. And for your reference, I've been to and would recommend um, these particular residencies. Uh, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, which is close by for most of us here in DC, as is the Porches. Um, Malay in upstate New York, the Vermont Studio Center, obviously in Vermont. Wild Acres, which is in Western North Carolina in the mountains near Asheville and Hambage, which is in um, Northern Georgia, uh, just south of the North Carolina border. I also um, had to put my, my two book covers in there, my essay collection, Be With Me Always, which I mentioned I ordered during a very dense and wonderful three-day residency at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. And I have a lyric essay anthology coming out in the fall called A Harp in the Stars, which I put together mostly during pandemic times and with no residency, no residency at all. So I will stop sharing so we can see each other. And if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat and uh, I'll be happy to answer. And if uh, any announcements need to be made, um, please, uh, please jump right in to uh, help people get to the agenting rooms that they're all aiming for. But thank you very much. It looks like everybody is looking forward to your to your next collection. That's the that's what we're that's what we're waiting for. Um, uh, this has been recorded. It's going to be made available to all all of our participants. Um, so uh, uh, yeah. So Jacob is asking, can you share the PowerPoint? So this will be um, 
if if Randon is willing to share the actual PowerPoint, we'll be happy to send that out to everybody. But it will also be in the uh, in the recorded session that we'll make available to everyone. So uh, so one way or the other. And uh, so thank you so much, Randon. That was wonderful. You're very and, welcome. Uh, and excellent. So um, we're gonna take just um, five minutes. And we're, uh, we're going to start up with Pat Schulteis, who's going to be talking about uh, writing memoir. So she's uh, she's taught memoir and uh, she's and struggling memoir. at and the she, moment. She's struggling, Jenny. Uh, so. OK, well, we will give you as much time as you need since uh, since we don't have anybody following you. So we're going to um, we're going to take a break from the program for the moment. Um, and we're just trying to get every everybody settled into this afternoon's um, sessions. So we'll we'll take a few minutes and Pat will give me the high sign when she's ready to go. So thanks. Uh, I'm having trouble starting my video. Jenny? Okay, uh, hold on, I'm gonna make you a co-host so that you can uh, share. I'm, share I'm, your... I'm having trouble with my video. Okay, well, uh, tell you what, chat me and, uh, and I will get back to you. Okay. 